Good evening and welcome to Making the Case. Thank you very much for joining me this evening. Now today, good sense prevailed at the Ghana Elections Commission and GCOM has agreed to 100% verification of the data from the truncated house-to-house -house registration. Now, last week, we were alarmed when we heard that GCOM was not going to do any sort of verification for the 20,556 names who they claimed were new registrants data collected from the house-to-house -house, uh, registration. Now, if you recall, the house-to-house -house registration um, was deemed, was stopped by, by GCOM because the Chief Justice ruled that it cannot, that they, in the way it was being carried out, the GCOM cannot remove names from the NRR, that it was illegal to do so. And therefore, the house to house, the entire house to house activity was rendered useless at that point because the whole idea was to uh, remove all of the, the registrants from the National Register and to start over. Um, so we have been calling for the verification of these 20,556 names that they claim are new registrants because we started to carry out checks um, and we found over 50% or the majority of the persons of that, that 20,000 um, were duplicates. They were already on the PLE. And we highlighted some of those findings. We published some of those findings as um, some of you may have seen. The, the former chancellor of judici the judiciary, Cecil Kennard, retired Justice Cecil Kennard was also on the list as a new registrant, even though he's, he's in his 80s. So he has clearly voted in, in several elections, but he was among the 20,556 that were regarded, that are regarded as a new registrant. So clearly, this list is contaminated. Clearly, this data is unverified. And Lowenfield told uh, the PPP clearly a few days ago, if you want to do verification, if you want this list to be verified, you have to go and do it. The PPP has to do it. And it is not our job. We will do it. We will certainly do it. And we have been doing it. Uh, we started um, the process internally, going out in the fields to, to verify these persons. But it is not our job. It is GCOM's responsibility to carry out this verification, especially in the light of the, the inconsistencies and the mistakes that we have found on that list. And it is our duty to be there to, to scrutinize that process. So like we've said many, many times in the party, we do not wish to disenfranchise any voter and our actions have always been uh, to, to match what we're seeing. What I mean um, by this is that from the inception, if you remember, President Granger in a speech said that the list was bloated by 200,000 persons, he claimed. He said that with impunity. Nobody questioned him on that. Nobody asked him to explain where he got that figure from. Even the chief elections officer said that the list is good and if there's a claims and objections period, it can be refreshed. So nobody questioned the president on that. And since he is out there putting, uh, putting that rhetoric out there that the list is bloated, why have his commissioners then been so resistant to having this verification done? Clearly, there is something sinister um, at, at work here. And so having this data merged with the list of electors would bring into question the integrity of the entire voters list. 
we do not want unverified data. What is the problem with having data on, on ver, uh, having data verified? We have been fighting and calling for free and fair elections in this country, and everything that we have been calling for is consistent um, with having free and fair elections. So I just wanted to highlight the conduct of the government commissioners uh, on, the, on the Guyana Elections Commission. And I want the people of Guyana to know that the PPP is the only party that has been and is fighting for free and fair elections in this country. We recently saw about 20 parties um, apply to have their symbols submitted uh, to contest uh, the next general and regional elections in March. And none of them, none of them are questioning what is going on at GCOM. None of them are exposing the fight that we have at GCOM. They love to get on television and on, on, on Facebook and hold press conferences every week to talk about what they will do and to promise the Guyanese people more and more. The promises get more and more lavish every week, more lavish and more unrealistic every week. But they are not on the forefront fighting for the most important thing right now, which is having free and fair elections. Because you can, you can promise people the world, but if APNU is successful in putting in place its, its rigging machinery, none of that will come to fruition. So the most important thing right now is for us to fight to ensure we have free and fair elections. And I urge everyone, PPP supporters and uh, non-supporters, to not be exhausted uh, with, this, with this process. I know it's, it's been a long time. We should have had elections months ago. But we have been winning. And if you, you look back at the victories that we have had, whether you regard them as small or large, but the victories that we have had, it has been consistent. We have won the battle in every instance. We won the no confidence motion. The government appealed and we went all the way to the CCJ. We, we were vindicated that the no confidence vote was validly taken in the National Assembly. We won at the CCJ with Patterson's uh, appointment. We argued that his appointment was illegal. We won that battle as well. He was forced to resign. We took the house to house process to court. And in the manner in which it was being carried out, the court ruled that that process was illegal, that they could not deregister people. And therefore, the house to house was stopped. We took the fight to have every single Guyanese, we, every single Guyanese was, they, they tried to force through an order, GCOM tried to force every Guyanese who was on the voters list to go in to verify uh, their existence, if you remember that. And we said no, as long as those persons' names are on the voters list, then they, they are properly there and they should not have to go into to GCOM uh, to verify their identity. GCOM subsequently withdrew that order. Uh, we fought for the 20,000 who they were, who the government commissioners were fighting to have removed who did not pick up their ID cards over the years. We said no, that is illegal again because having an ID card is not a requirement to vote. So we won there again. We fought for this house to house data to be verified before it is merged with the, the voters list and again we have won that battle because today, like I said earlier on the program, uh, the GCOM chair voted with the opposition commissioners, which the PPP commissioners, uh, to have this data verified before it is merged with the voters list. And that is the only thing that makes sense in the first place. So I don't want persons, especially our supporters, to be 
to be bogged down, to feel like every day is a new fight. And it is, every day almost. Um, we have a new fight, we have a new challenge. Uh, but we, we are not, we've gotten this far. We are not going to give up. We will continue to fight for the right of every Guyanese to be able to cast their vote, for every Guyanese to given a free and fair elections in which they can choose who they want to govern them for the next five years. And um, we will continue. We will continue. We will not tire. We will continue to take that fight. And um, you can rely on us for that. So I wanted to, to, and I don't want those at home to be discouraged as well. And so I highlighted all of the victories that we have had. So you can see that, you know, we have always and in every case been vindicated. And should any new challenge uh, arise, um, we will guide you in the right direction. We will continue to do what is right. Because as long as we follow the law, as long as we follow the Constitution, and we follow the laws of Guyana, um, there's no way that uh, what we're saying can be, can be inconsistent with that. And there's no way that we will be wrong in that regard. So that's what I wanted to say on uh, GCA. Now, we saw a troubling report um, through the Bloomberg News. We, that was when the story was was uh, the story first broke, and we heard that the government is trying to negotiate the sale of our oil in a backroom um, negotiation, so to put it. First, we heard, um, after the article came out, we heard, we heard Bino say, actually before that article, we heard uh, Dr. Bino, who's the head of the Department of Energy, say that the oil companies will face no penalties for overstating um, their costs. And if you remember, we talked about that right here on this program last week, that a bill has been submitted already to the government of Ghana for $10 billion. And we have no way of verifying um, or confirming the expenditure that ExxonMobil is claiming. And now we hear uh, Bino say that there'll be no uh, penalties um, for overstatement of costs. And then we found out that um, they have been negotiating um, to have the first, uh, to have for the sale of the first three lifts of oil, um, for Guyana's share of the first three lifts of oil. Now, for those of you who may not know, we, the money we will, re we will receive from, from the oil companies will be, it's going to be paid in oil. So we then have to sell um, that oil to get to recover our, our money or our share of profit oil. So, but this type of backroom behind the scenes, closeted negotiations, and then by no saying, oh, we wanted to tie up um, this deal and then come to the people and tell them what we did, um, that is highly unusual and that reeks of suspicion. So we don't, we don't want that. We don't want that kind of shady um, negotiation for our oil resources or any of our, our country's natural resources. But there are bigger issues with this type of selected uh, negotiation. So they've handpicked the companies that they are negotiating with to sell our oil. So first of all, the government, so a few things are wrong with that. First of all, the government is illegal. They have no mandate from the people of this country. Um, and so therefore they have no business um, tying up any long-term agreements at this point. Secondly, um, our share of profit oil um, will come in March of next year. So it's not gonna come before, it's gonna come in March of next year. So why are we even negotiating the sale of it now? Oil, like goal, the, the price for oil, quality of the oil has a lot to do with determining the price for the oil. 
And as you know, you've heard, we've heard Exxon boast many times that the quality of the oil found here is very, very high and therefore should fetch um, a good price. So it doesn't make sense that now, in December, we're trying to negotiate um, the sale for this oil, and this oil hasn't been lifted as yet. It has not been tested um, for its quality. And us setting a price now or agreeing to a price for that now, um, we will definitely lose um, current market value after that oil has been lifted. So there's no reason that we should be doing that um, now. Thirdly, um, we are less than three months away from a general elections. And they choose this period to lock our country in an arrangement. Our party has made it clear that any attempt, any attempt to tie our country to a long-term agreement will be reversed. We have argued that our argument is that since we are so close to the elections, why not let Exxon sell our share of profit oil in the, at, at the same price as theirs? They have to sell theirs too. They can sell our share at the same price as theirs and put the money in an account. And then we can have a transparent process for selling our oil through a, a properly conducted bidding process a properly publicized bidding process. And every company that comes has to come with a track record, and they have to bid in an open, transparent way of who will sell our oil and at what price. So if we get stuck now with any long-term agreement, um, we, will be, we will be in trouble, and we will lose money because, you know, we have not this oil has not been lifted, and we do not know the quality of it, so therefore um, we would not be able to set a price that would reflect that, that quality. And then to hear, to hear the head of our energy department say things like, um, they're doing this because, in, in, in his words, they want to, to watch and learn, and that they will be relying on the traders to, and I quote, hold Guyana's hand and show it how to sell its oil. You mean to tell me it's nothing we can't do for ourselves? Nothing Guyanese are, are competent enough to do? Four and a half years later, they haven't figured out how to run this country. But they know exactly how to decide when they are negotiating their Cummingsburg Accord, they know exactly how to divide up the perks or how to divide up the pie after the elections. They don't need international consultants to tell them how to share the perks of office, um, but they need international uh, consultants and international companies to come and hold their hand, um, as Dr. Baino put it, so that we can watch and learn you know, we, we don't have the, the, the ability or the, or the capability or the expertise to, to, to sell our own oil, as though oil is so different, you know, from, from negotiating any other of our natural resources. So talking, since we're on the, on the topic of, of dividing, dividing up the pie, so the negotiations of APNU, and AFC have centered around who will get what. So they've spent a lot of time over the past few months with the in-house fighting and dividing, the dividing up of the next government. Um, they're not meeting to formulate policies for the development of our country. They're not concerned with improving health care. They're not in concerned with uh, improving education, infrastructure, jobs, young people, women's issues, children's issues. They're not interested in any of that. They are meeting to decide um, what share they will get, what position um, each party will get. They have not won a single seat as yet. A single vote has not been cast as yet, but they are already dividing up the perks of office. And so their actions clearly show 
where their interests are. And that is, that is, that is clearly in alignment with how they've spent um, the last four and a half years. Uh, the spending has increased um, enormously. The coalition government has spent $1.1 trillion dollars and we have seen nothing for that money. They have increased taxes by $88 billion annually. In, tw in, in 2014, if we do a quick uh, comparison, the total tax collection under the PPP government was $135 billion. Now it's close to $230 billion nearly 70% increase in, tax in, in taxation, 70% increase. So when you wonder where did that extra money go that I used to have in my pocket after I, I, I collect my salary and I pay my bills, where did that extra money go? Where did my disposable income go? This is where it went. It went in taxes. People have no idea how much more taxes they pay on a daily basis. And this is what is drying up the economy. This is what is drying up people's pockets. And this is why this is December month, it's Christmas time, and you can get parking on, on Regent Street. Because people are, not, people are not buying. Or if the road is busy with traffic, you look in the stores. People are simply not shopping. People don't have money to shop. So they have spent all this money, 1.1, trillion dollars. They've borrowed an additional 900 million dollars, putting our country um, in debt, increased taxes by 88 billion dollars, and we have no improvement in any of the sectors. They've been closing um, many of the sectors and running people out of business. So there's been, there's been no improvement. And when people ask us, where we're going to get the money to do many of the, the or to implement many of the plans that, that we have, the first thing we have to do is, is cut the spending. We have to get, get rid of the wastage um, that this government is currently engaged in. They spent $1.6 billion in food, just, just on food. And um, it's, it's and if you do a quick um, comparison, it is close to that amount that it would have cost them to continue giving the school children their $10,000 grant. But instead of continuing that program, which was a pro poor program in which every single Guyanese child could have benefited across the board, instead of continuing that program, they now uh, eat, eat that money uh, in, in food instead rental for, for buildings, spending on, on travel, uh, staying in lavish hotels. This is what they prefer to spend the money on. This is what they choose to spend our hard-earned hard tax dollars uh, on. This, and you know what? This mentality, this, this culture that they are engaged in is the same culture that used to prevail uh, in the PNC on the Burnham. I sat right here on this program many programs ago and read to you from, from Father Andrew Morrison's book, um, The Fight for Democracy in Guyana, and we read about the lavish lifestyle um, that Burnham and the PNC ministers used to engage in when they, for example, when they travel the champagne that would be served on board and the lobster and the steaks, etc., that, that would be served on board those, those airplanes and the entourage that would, uh, that would accompany the president. And that is the same, is the same people who existed then, exist now in office, and they have, and they brought that same culture with them. This bunch here is dangerous uh, for, for our country. They spoke a lot about transparency and accountability. What has been their actions? They have disbanded the Integrity Commission. Their ministers are not um, uh, making declarations um, to the Integrity Commission. The PPP ministers have every year made their declarations to the Integrity Commission. Their, their declarations have been open to public scrutiny. 
Barjagdio himself has made um, his, his declarations um, to the Integrity Commission. The president, I don't believe, has made a single declaration since taking office. So no more talk about transparent and accountable government. That, that is dead. They've, they, they're done with that. They've moved on from that. And every, every agency is in trouble. Uh, GPL, GWI, uh, NIS, GGMC, Forestry, LANS, all of these agencies are having trouble even paying their staff. But you don't, you don't hear about these things. You saw um, the reports that NIS is tanking, and we know why, because over 30,000 persons now are not uh, making uh, payments on a monthly basis to the NIS. And right here on this program, we spoke about the effects of bad policies that we may not see it now but that it will affect us in the future in many years to come and this is this is the behind the scenes running down of the economy um, that we can't see right now but that we will feel in the near future and and i and i spoke about that um before that the time to save our country is now many of the the a lot of the effects of what this government is doing now we will feel in the future so we have to stop it now before it gets worse we don't have another five years people are starving we've seen that we saw what happened um in Aichuni when young afro guyanese men took to the streets the protest for food. The young man said he's hungry. He only got, uh, he's a logger, he only got 35 tags for the year. When we expose the issue, then they ran down to Aichuni and they give them um, a few more tags so that they can, they can go and, and work and feed their families. They don't care what is happening from the ground, what is happening uh, on the ground. They live in their ivory towers, they live in Pearl. They don't care what is happening to, to, to the ordinary Guyanese. And now they live in houses that look like malls. So if you've been, been reading the newspapers, you will see what the cartoonist Paul Harris um, drew, I think it was on Sunday, that Minister Ferguson's house you know, looks like a mall. And what two and a half years, I believe, she's a minister within a ministry, and she is able to construct a house of that size, magnitude. No, no declaration to the Integrity Commission. Um, prior to being in government, I believe she lived with relatives. She had no home of her own. And she is able, one person alone is able to acquire that amount of wealth and build a house of that size um, in two and a half years as a minister within a ministry. I don't know what, what else we need to see to know that our money, our hard-earned money, is just going to fill the pockets of those who are in office and their friends, their cronies, and their families. That's where, that's where our, our money is going. And if you want to truly appreciate, and I was telling, I, I was talking to a young man today, and I said to him, if you want to truly appreciate what the PPP had accomplished during its time in office, you have to go back to 1992. You have to go back to what the PPP inherited after 28 years of Burnham. Sometimes. Uh, recently, I was driving in a car um, with an older person down Main Street, and they said to me, you have no idea how bad the potholes were um, on Main Street. Main Street was not a street. It was like a dam. I don't know that I, I, because I, in 1992, sure, I was already born, but I was a kid. So I don't know what um, the streets of Georgetown looked like then. So I have to go and do my, do my research and do my reading. So in 1992, uh, the debt owed by Guyana uh -huh, was 900% of GDP. We owed the world 900% of our GDP. We had to borrow to pay debts. Or as the older folks would say, you, 
we had to dig a hole to fill a hole. So by the time the PPP left office, remember, we're 900% GDP. 900% of our GDP is owed in debts. By the time the PPP left office in 2015, it was 50% of GDP. We're talking figures now. Let's, let's get real. This meant that the economy grew from 300 million to 3 billion under the PPP administration. Servicing the debt took 153% of revenue. By the time the PPP left office, it was 4 to 5% of revenue, all the revenue collected by the government. This means that by the time APNU and AFC went into office, 9 to 5%, just think about it, 9 to 5% of total revenue collected by government remained with government because only about 5% went to paying debts. So the PPP took a bankrupt country, they made it viable. Interest rates were 35 to 40 percent. Inflation was triple digits. PPP brought it down to a single digit. We left them with reserves. We didn't take, uh, PPP didn't take Guyana with reserves. It took it heavily indebted. It was not even credit worthy. We left 700 million US dollars in the central bank. 20 billion in gold reserves, they, which they've almost completely sold out. PPP gave out 100,000 house lots in their housing programs, and 75% um, of 75,000 of those went for 100,000 or under 100,000 Guyana dollars. I was doing, uh, I was distributing some material at the the penitence market, and I met a young Afro-Guyanese woman, and she was telling me her story. She has six kids. She went, um, after she accumulated $100,000, because she knew of the, the housing program, and she saved up 100000 Guyana dollars, and went in, in, in 2015 or 2016, I believe, um, to purchase her house lot from the, the APNU AFC, and found out that there was nothing below $500,000. They had no house lot uh, below 500,000. And remember, they have not developed a single new housing scheme. So this was, they were selling house lots that they repossessed um, from persons that were given house lots under the PPP tenure. And so she clearly does not have $500,000 to pay for a land alone, and then she has to build. So herself and her, her six kids, I don't know where they are or where they're living, um, I believe she said they're living, they're living with relatives, but she's now um, selling pepper at the, the penitence market to try to make ends meet. And she can't wait um, to vote these people out of office. So we started those, those housing projects. All of those, those house lots, for example, that were given out for $100,000, it's another pro-poor policy. And Harmon has the gall to say that, that the, 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 PPP, the PPP manifesto is not, is not for poor people. The PPP is a working class party. The PPP is a national party. The PPP always designs its policies and programs to lift up the poorer class. And I think every objective mind in Guyana knows that. They knew what Chetty Jagan was about. And, and the, the beliefs of Chedi Jagan still remain. It is still at the heart of the People's Progressive Party. And that is one of the main reasons that I, that I support this party. And also because they keep their promises. If you look, look at the broken promises of the APNU AFC, they've broken all of their promises in health, in education, in infrastructure, young people, Amerindians. They, they, they broke their promises to the security forces, um, even to their supporters. Their supporters are among some of the most disappointed people in this country, and some of the most hard hit have been their own supporters. What, take, they went to Linden to launch uh, their campaign, begging Lindeners to give them a second chance. What have they done for Linden? They, 
in, I believe it was 2002, uh, the PPP launched the Linden Economic Advance Program, known as uh, LEAP. It's a project that was funded um, between a collaboration between the government of Guyana and the EU for 12 million euro dollars. The objective was to encourage entrepreneurship and to promote the economic development um, of Linden and to expand um, Region 10's economic base uh, through diversification of the local economy and to start to remove their dependence on the bauxite industry. The PPP built the Linden Hospital. That project came with a price tag of $1.8 billion. They created the largest housing scheme in the entire community, in the entire Caribbean community, uh, Amelia's Ward. Um, so Lindeners can, can own and build their own homes. Uh, they built a 13 million US dollar water treatment plant so Lindeners can have portable water. They saved the electricity subsidy uh, for 20 years at $500 a month when the rest of the country, um, you know, light bill is killing everybody else um, in, in, in the rest of the country. They supported the creation and the operation of, of Linden Tongue Week so that businesses can be promoted, that vendors um, can benefit from the, the tourists who visit and the overseas Guyanese who come to, 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 sp to spend their money in Linden. They supported the Kashif and Shanghai uh, football tournament where young Lindeners were given the opportunity to become more involved in sports and to showcase their, their talent. And they more, most importantly, they saved the bauxite industry. Even when the IMF uh, recommended that it should be closed, contrast, contrast that with what APNU did with sugar. Just imagine if a PPP government had closed the bauxite industry in a region, Region 10, which is uh, traditionally a APNU uh, support base. Imagine if the PPP had done that how that would have looked on the PPP. You would have heard all these things. You see, we told you they're a racist party. Um, they're not for Afro-Guyanese. But the PPP didn't do that, contrary to the IMF recommending that the industry should be closed. The PPP saved bauxite. Contrast that, like I said, with sugar. This government ordered its own feasibility study into the sugar industry. And the, and the findings came back that sugar shouldn't, that the industry should not be closed. That is what their own study found. And what did they do? They proceeded with closing uh, the sugar estates, with some of the sugar estates. Imagine what would have happened to Linden if we had closed bauxite. It would have been as desolate as it is in Wales. Uh, today. We would not have heard the end of that. And all of this, all of the money that was, was injected into the, the, the economic development in Linden had to be balanced against the demands of the other regions. Because everybody wants, everybody wants more. And so when you, you take an economy in 1992 that was bankrupt uh, and, to and to take it to where it was left in 2015 was no easy task. And so if anybody wants to really appreciate, especially the young people, I urge them to go and do their own research because, you know, we, we're like, we drive around Georgetown now or we drive around the country, um, even pre-2015, and we thought, oh, everything is, everything is good. Um, we want more now, which is reasonable. Um, in any um, growing economy, you want more. You want improvements in, IC in the ICT sector, and, and you, know, you want all these advanced things. You look at the rest of the world, and you compare yourself to the rest of the world, and we want all these advancements in technology, etc. Now, we're in 2019, four and a half years later, and we're fighting for free and fair elections. Hunger has returned. In, 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 in some communities, 
This is where this government has taken us in four and a half years. So when you really want to appreciate what the PPP did, go back to 1992 and see what they inherited and then see how the country was left in 2015. And then you will have a real appreciation um, for what the PPP achieved in its tenure uh, in office. And you know, they, they have not done anything in any sector. Everything has been left um, by the wayside. And I know in a, in a, I've been going on for a while and I have to take some calls, but um, if you, I know persons will call me and talk about the sugar industry, but if you, that the sugar industry wasn't, you know, making money and, and they like to say, oh, if, if you had a business and it's not making money, um, wouldn't you close it? But that was not the point. Look at what, Obama did um, in 2008 when um, the housing market in the U.S. crashed. So everybody said he should let the banks fail. All of the advice and even the popular opinion was let the banks fail. They put us in this mess, let them fail. What did Obama do? He bailed out the banks. He took money and he gave it to the banks that got them in trouble in the first place. But he saw the bigger picture. He saw that millions of Americans would lose their homes, would lose their savings. He could not allow that to happen. So he made an agreement with the banks. I will give you this money, you will pay me back in interest. Many, many people, including Americans, don't know that today, by the time Obama left office in 2015, that those banks, all of the money that he lent to the banks was repaid with interest every single cent was returned to the American people. And that is the same kind of logic um, that the PPP has when it comes um, to sugar in this country. Yes, we must encourage agriculture, we must encourage our manufacturing sector, but there's so many more benefits that came with sugar. Um, foreign currency, it kept um, thousands of, of Guyanese employed, um, Gaisuku, maintained uh, the drains and irrigation. People didn't have to face this amount of uh, fees um, for drainage and so on. So it, it, it made farming cheaper. So, so many um, benefits were attached to keeping um, sugar going. And the, this government was too narrow-minded, too tunnel vision to see the benefits of that. When you look at Education, that is a, that is a big deal um, for me as a, as a young person. APNU has not built a single new school, even the most basic development in a sector. At least build a school, they haven't even done that. Um, we need to end the culture of focusing on the top performing students and the, and the top performing schools. And we need to allocate uh, resources and distribute resources equitably among all of the schools. Um, and I heard the leader of the opposition spoke about removing uh, the corporate tax from private educational institutions, which will help them uh, to reduce the costs of uh, private education so persons can um, afford, more Guyanese can afford private education uh, from nursery to, to secondary and then their tertiary education. More people, more Guyanese can, can obtain master's degrees and, and PhDs and so on if it becomes more affordable. And this removal of corporate tax, um, of the corporate tax, because corporate tax is about 40%, I believe, um, which, is a, which is a big, um, it's a heavy taxation. So if that is removed, um, we can certainly promote higher education in Guyana. And I, for one, it's my personal belief that the education system, not only in Guyana, but globally, is outdated. And I would love to see more focus on information technology, um, on, on ICT. Because, you know, my, my son is doing um, IT in school, and I go through his, his books, and I see that he is learning about the computer in his IT class. 
So he's not learning how to use this computer. He's learning about the purpose of the keyboard and the purpose of the mouse and the purpose of the CPU, which is okay, but that only takes like one class um, to learn that. But he's not being taught how to use the internet responsibly, how to do research. And, and this is the future. This is how we have to train our young people for the future. This is how we have to prepare them for jobs um, in the future, while we want to still encourage persons to, uh, to enhance their vocational skills, because we need all the, all the skills, whether it's vocational, whether it's farming, we need young people to be involved in all of that. But a lot of the work in the future will require um, IT skills. And so we have to prepare our kids now to be, we have to prepare them to be eligible um, for those jobs in the future, especially um, now that we are going to be a oil producing um, country. And I remember something that a mentor of mine said to me years ago when I was studying, when I was studying law. Um, I was one of those students that loved to recite um, cases. So when I was, uh, when I would write my, my answers, I would put the name of of the case and I would give the full citation. I would say exactly which law report it came from and um, I would give the page numbers and everything. I used to enjoy um, retaining that, that information. I used to get a kick from it. I didn't gain any extra marks from it, but I enjoyed um, citing that in my, in my essays. And so one of my mentors, he read one of my essays and he said, you know, Susan, it's not important, in the future, it wouldn't be important how much um, we can retain in our minds, but where we can find that information once we, when we need it. And so he said, if you're going to have um, a textbook, you must not, you don't, it's not important that you know everything that is written in this textbook, but that you know the geography of the book. And you know, that, that stayed with me and the internet is, a lot like that. You know, our young people are not required or will not be required in the future to retain all this information, to have all this information in their minds, and then go and sit an exam um, and show how good, how good retention skills you have. It will be about um, how you can find this information, how you can use the internet responsibly, and, and if you can, you know, what you can produce um, in response. To, 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 to questions asked and, and, and for your job. So um, that, is, that is what I want to say um, for this evening. I have a lot more to talk about, but I want to go to the, to the phone lines and take a few calls before we run out of time. Caller, good evening. Good evening to you, Susan. You know, in the days of Hitler, mm -hmm. he established a ministry his minister was Dr. Joseph Goebbels. He was minister for propaganda and public enlightenment. So any dictator mm -hmm. will need their propagandists to do their work. Mm -hmm. What we have seen is that every, what you know, I was saying the other day, that they have the same resources like the PPP. Mm. And they did better. <laughs> you imagine in four years, they spent $1.2 trillion. That's the money, among the money that the PPP spent in the last 12 years. Mm -hmm. What have they got to show? Right? Yes. So, when you look, these people have failed to see that there is an information boom in this world all over. People mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm an old man. And everything that is happening around in Guyana, you have it on the internet, you have it on Facebook. You can access these things in newspapers. Right. People die just for having a camera. You can remember Father Dark mm -hmm. died in Georgetown. He was mm -hmm. killed just for just taking a picture Picture. that during the Bornham era. Yes. So people feel these ministers, them and these, um, Apologize them for this coalition. Fail to understand that people out in Guyana here knows exactly what is happening. 
That's right. right? Mm -hmm. So that's my contribution. Yes. All right, Carla, thank you. The caller was just um, reinforcing uh, what I was what I was saying. We have another caller on the line. Caller, good evening. Hello. Hi, please turn on your television volume. Hello. Okay. Yes, dear, go ahead. I'm calling to find out where the PPP went in 23 and I was not doing nothing. Okay, that's your contribution? Yeah. At AP, I mean, just went there for us, and I was offering to do something. They did something? Yeah, they PNG. Uh huh. Tell us, tell us what they did. Hello? Yeah. You ready to give me some examples? You know, I, I get the sense that as a young person, just calling to, to waste time. Um, when you call in to my program, I like to encourage um, the callers to, you know, come bring your facts. Let's have um, an informed discussion. You know, we have people at home who are, who are watching, who are listening. Let's not waste my time and theirs. Caller, good evening. Very good night to you. Hi. How are you keeping? I'm fine, thanks. Would you agree with me that when the government closed down the sugar escape, mm -hmm. they did that because they had one day from my shop, the PPP support base, and then to take the land and convert it into their own personal use and their friends' use. Mm -hmm. when, when they were campaigning, you could see that they have mastered the art of deception, some attacking, double standards, and mm -hmm. hypocrisy. Yes. Because people can see that in reality. Mm -hmm. And then by his next some pockets, you know, them truck with a set right from Bobby's to the wharf. Then by pocket big more than them back door. So all and do is to pull up them packet and then print the packet. Yep. There is one minister in this government. He is probably one of the richest Negro in this world. You can find out the world. Mm -hmm. Good night. Okay, Carla, thank you for coming through. And thank you for your contribution. Hello? Hello? Hello, good night. Good night, caller. Hi, Susanna. Am I just calling to make my contribution? Sure. I would like to ask the APN if in their time they would have ever built a stadium, if they would have ever built the thing at Lillian that we have for the sport event. Nothing they ever do. They waste the money on the urban park. Yeah, I was, about, I was about to say they built Durban Park, $600 million missing. And look what we have there. Uh, that, the Durban Park is a national embarrassment. And I don't know if they don't feel ashamed when they talk about Durban Park. What I'm going to take it over. That is a, a disgrace and a colossal waste of taxpayers' money. All right, Susan. Good night to you. All right, thank you for coming through. Caller, good evening. Hi, Susan. Good night, how are you doing? Hi, fine, thanks. You know, you was uh, doing a chronology of the victories you had. Uh, I think the greatest victory we had is really you. You is the person that really put reality and uh, logic back in attraction. You know, like, because what they were doing from the no confidence vote continually had this whole country wanting to know if they were mad or was the, the citizens were mad with, mm -hmm. them, with what they were carrying on with, right? Yeah. And last week I went complaining about the uh, 
the hospital and the education system, right? Mm -hmm. But if you need a surgery in this country and you go to the Georgia Hospital, imagine you in pain, right? And you go to the Georgia Hospital, you got to get a date till next year, you know. You understand? We see health, health, health care in this country about. Mm -hmm. And the ten billion dollars that uh, they got, they owed Exxon Mobil put on them or something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Gordon Moses was excited about that. He had any any news uh, news carrying on that uh, <laughs> Nasdaq. Yeah, he's, he's he's always very excited when there's a new oil find, as yeah. though you know some no, no, old but, uh, I, 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 Guyanese yeah, are gonna. Have no, uh, New, new, new slash on uh, news break. Mm -hmm. but, uh, he should have been excited about it too, because I excited. I glad if there uh, it, it should have been a hundred billion, because um, remember this we are highly in that the poor countries and undeveloped countries, and when we compare debt like that, it speaks a lot about us. Mm -hmm. If we are capable of paying that amount of money in a debt, and we are so highly in debt in poor countries, I mean, from a world view, uh, we looking good. Imagine they're so excited about selling off the first three lifts of oil. Mm -hmm. And we're starting at a negative because we already owe Exxon $10 billion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you see, listen to me. You see, when you're reasoning from this TV, right, and you're using your logic, you must understand why you could be on the TV reasoning. You understand that everybody capable and competent to understand your reasoning. So you must not argue with any and everybody. Right? You, they, they can't understand what you're saying. You have to have a certain amount of the intellect well, to understand what you're saying. You so know, don't argue but, them. but let me read this mm -hmm. thing, right? Go ahead. Uh, you know it's a chancery, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that chancery is like a court of equity. If you are in a court of equity, right, and the judge is transparently being sympathetic to one side of the aggrieved parties and dismisses the other side concerned as invalid, right? Then what you will have to accept is the party to whom the judge is sympathetic to having uh, influencing, right? That party who she says is sympathetic to is going to be influencing, determining, and conditioning an outcome that is in to their own advantage. So in essence, what the judge is actually doing in, uh, in a court like that when she is biased is facilitating a part of victory. I want to relate the really to the GCOM and the commissioner, the commissioner they have there, mm -hmm. right? Because it's something similar to that. She's supposed to be there as a as a, a person of equity, right? Yes. But if she is being one-sided, what she is doing, she is giving that party the determinant of being uh, of being in the advantage of of of, of uh, influencing the outcome of, this, of of something, right? The decision. Yes. Right. Well, today, today she 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 did the right thing. She acted fairly, and you know we don't question her integrity. We want to give her a no, fair I chance. Understand. She yeah. has to be mm -hmm. equitable. That is her role. In she's not a judge. She is there as a person of equity. Mm -hmm. as a, and if she does not follow that that rule of equity, she is given both either side could be the advantage of if or influencing the outcome of a, of a situation. Right. Right to that? Yeah. All right, Carl. All right, thanks, Lance. You're gonna have to tell me what is the um what is your what's the trick to getting through on this program because you manage to get through every week I and I have and I have before. people telling me how they've been calling me for months and they can't yeah, get yeah, through. No, it's my turn. You see that to the end. Eh? <laughs> I'll give everybody right. a chance and take the last. All right, Carla, thank, thank you. Right. And and you are going to be our uh, final caller for this evening. Um, next week Tuesday. That's all the time I have um, for this evening. Um, next week Tuesday will be the 24th of December. It's um, Christmas Eve. Um, I don't know if you want to, um, I don't believe you want to hear Susan Rodriguez on the, on the TV, abusing Dong Apnu and making the case for the PPP's re-election. I believe that we have made that case. Um, the case is made um, for the re-election of the People's uh, Progressive Party. Um, as the party to lead our country into the future, as the party that will govern um, for all Guyanese, for the benefit 
of all uh, Guyanese, regardless of your race, religion, etc. Um, so um, I may may not be here um, on Christmas Eve unless something uh, comes up, and um, it's really really important that I be here. Um, I, I I would come, of course, um, but for now, um, let me just wish you all um, a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. I hope that um, with whatever we have, whatever resources, whatever gifts we have to share this year, um, that we will find a contentment with it. And I, I truly wish God's blessing on everyone um, who's watching and all of my Guyanese brothers and sisters um, in this season. Um, so thank you very much um, for joining me for for all the months. When I started this program, I thought it would have been for about three months. Um, that was in April. It's December and you know we're still here, but it's a pleasure to be here with you every evening and your words of encouragement um, and support always uh, keeps me coming back. Um, so, like I said, um, all the best to, to everyone and I will see you soon. Good night.